Okay, uh, time for our last keynote presentation of the day, um, starting off with Karina Grindle. Thank you. Uh, hello, so uh, as Jonathan said, my name is uh, Karina Grindle, and I'm going to be doing the introduction for the talk today is PBS, Good Practice uh, But Bad Science. And then um, after I've spoken, my two colleagues, Dr. Judy Joseph and uh, Sally Nicholas, will continue to explore this theme using some examples uh, from their own practice. And Dr. Freddie Jackson Brown is going to provide some concluding uh, comments to our talk. Okay, so just to provide a little bit of context for our talk today, I'd like to explain that we all work for uh, an organization which is based in Wiltshire called Positive Behaviour Solutions. Now, the main aim of our organization is to help children and young people with learning disabilities uh, who have behaviours uh, that challenge. And we hope to help these children realise their full potential by really helping to develop the capacity of locally available services to support their needs. So our underlying philosophy that guides our practice, practice is really to work actively in partnership with local uh, commi commissioners to help identify and establish person-centred models of best practice that are evidence-based and which will meet the needs of the children that we're working with and meet the needs of uh, the families as well. Now we really aim to support these children so that they can stay living at home, they can stay going to their local schools and that they can um, stay living in their uh, local communities rather than being sent out of county to expensive uh, residential placements. Now importantly as well, uh, Positive Behaviour Solutions were a not-for-profit uh, social enterprise. So any financial surplus that is generated uh, through our organisation, we recycle that back into uh, services, training and research. So we pay for people, for example, to do the master's course in applied behaviour analysis and so on. Now this is our team uh, of behaviour analysts and assistant behaviour analysts who uh, work for Positive Behaviour Solutions. Uh, some of you here might uh, recognise there's a photo of Dr. Carl Hughes, who was talking this morning, um, the esteemed Dr. Sandy Tugood and Professor uh, Richard Hastings are there as well, and we feel very privileged um, that they have agreed to be external consultants for our team, based all the way down in uh, Wiltshire. Now, the services that we uh, currently offer in uh, Wiltshire, we're based across several sites, so we're working at Exeter House uh, School, special school in Salisbury, St Nicholas's School in Chippenham and Cannons House uh, Respite Centre in Devizes, and Sally will be talking more about some of our work there. Woodford Valley School in uh, Salisbury, and we're also going to be starting working uh, in another school uh, which is based in Melksham in uh, September. So we're, we're working all throughout uh, Wiltshire, really, in, in <laughs> these schools. Now this year we've also opened the Warden Centre, which is an exciting new partnership with Exeter House School, and the Warden Centre provides remote video conferencing uh, facilities for access to the master's course in applied behaviour analysis at Bangor University. So we've got people coming in from uh, the county to access the master's course there. And the Warden Centre as well, we're also hoping that it's going to be a real training uh, venue for not only Exeter House staff, but also for any uh, local professionals and parents that have an interest in uh, challenging behaviour and positive behaviour support. Okay, so that's just to give a little bit of background as to who we are and uh, what we do. Now, um, our talk today then, uh, we're going to explore whether or not the PBS model is good practice, uh, as we know that it is, but maybe whether or not it's a bad demonstration of, um, or sometimes a bad demonstration of a scientific approach to behaviour change. Now, if you consider the main, three main sources from which uh, positive behaviour support has emerged, you'll um, start to see uh, what I mean. So first of all, I mean, you all know this, um, in positive behaviour support, we incorporate concepts from applied behaviour analysis, such as uh, setting events, establishing operations, the three-term contingency, and so on, uh, as a foundation for all of the work that we do. And other treatment techniques such as shaping, fading, reinforcement contingencies and so on, we use these sorts of things all of the time. 
Now, these are all scientifically proven principles of uh, behaviour that have been demonstra demonstrated repeatedly in well-controlled experiments in the laboratory. But in general, the methodologies that are often promoted within applied behaviour analysis, uh, with many PBS practitioners, they sit uncomfortably uh, with us at times because it's considered that maybe some of those methodologies are a bit too rigid or a bit too narrow in focus or maybe uh, too radical to be able to be implement, implemented with real integrity in many of the uh, environments that we find ourselves working in, so in the home of the child, uh, in schools and so on. So although PBS is very firmly grounded in applied behaviour analysis, it's very much assumed its own identity with a real emphasis on trying to come up and use uh, treatments that have a real goodness of fit to uh, the different contexts that we find ourselves working in. Now, as most of you know as well, PBS is also influ influenced by the normalisation uh, movement. So this means that the focus of a PBS approach should always be to try and design a treatment programme that provides the means for an individual to be able to improve access to community activities and relationships with others who do not um, have a disability. So this here is a different uh, emphasis to uh, many traditional ABA programmes where in keeping with um, a scientific approach to behaviour change, there's often a considerable focus on addressing specific clinical problems in a very uh, systematic way. So for example, reducing the frequency of aggression using carefully um, controlled procedures. Now, person-centred values are also crucial in the development of uh, PBS. And according to Carr, there's three possible processes that are used to integrate um, the values approach into PBS. Now, person-centred planning, a few of the speakers have already uh, mentioned that uh, today. Um, also, the construct of self-determination. Uh, so this involves allowing individuals with uh, disabilities to really be involved in the decision-making regarding um, treatment goals. And also the process of using wraparound uh, services, so trying to incorporate an entire system of uh, people who might be involved in uh, providing supports. So particularly family members here being involved in uh, decision-making and not just the, uh, the professionals. Now, Karata also outlined these nine critical features of uh, positive behaviour support that really underpin um, our practice down in Wiltshire. Now, I haven't got time, obviously, to talk through all of them today, but I'm going to be referring to a few of them in a minute when I talk about some of the differences between uh, a more traditional ABA approach and the PBS approach. And there's also this recent paper by Gore uh, and colleagues, um, which... Louise mentioned um, earlier, and I just see I've got a typo there, 2014, it was actually uh, 2013. Um, and this really provides a refreshed uh, definition and scope for PBS that is hugely relevant to uh, the UK context and also, again, to the uh, work that we're doing uh, down in Wiltshire. Now, if we were to consider some of those key features that are described in those two papers, it really helps us to start to understand what some might consider to be these key differences between an ABA approach and a PBS approach. So if we take um, the first point on this slide, this is hugely relevant to uh, Carr's critical feature of comprehensive lifestyle change and quality of life. So whereas ABA approaches are often considered to be highly focused on changing the behaviour of a specific individual who is targeted for treatment, PBS attempts to change not only the complete lifestyle of the uh, individual that um, is undergoing the treatment, but also um, attempts to uh, help change um, and improve the quality of life for all of those people who uh, support the individual. So one of the central differences between the PBS and the, the ABA approach here really seems to be the order of importance and the order of uh, causation. So ABA really uh, focuses on changing behaviour first in order to support relative um, changes in lifestyle and enhanced quality of life, whereas PBS really places primary emphasis on trying to conduct changes in lifestyle and quality of life 
which in turn are supported by um, reductions in problem behaviour. And I think this is something that uh, Judy will be talking about uh, in her bit of the presentation. Now the second point is also to do with this emphasis on comprehensive lifestyle uh, change. So because PBS is focused on how individuals participate in life activities, how much they enjoy those activities, and how the life of the people around them is improved, so it's really focused on quality of life, this has real implications for the data collection uh, procedures that we use in uh, PBS. So in PBS, there's generally more of an emphasis on using global levels of um, data collection that really help to define uh, quality of life. So dependent variables such as the number of social interactions, the extent of participation in daily um, activities and so on. So this is different to the more micro level of measurement and analysis that's commonly used in applied behaviour analysis, such as taking data on things like the number of aggressive acts or the frequency of uh, self-injury. Now in positive behaviour support as well, there might also be a greater flexibility with regard to what is considered acceptable in terms of the data that is uh, collected, in the sense that qualitative data, qualitative data like uh, questionnaires, interviews and so on, and case study information, they're all considered uh, completely uh, acceptable. Whereas in um, ABA data collection methods, generally um, uh, have much more experimental uh, rigor. Now the third point uh, here is to do with the PBS emphasis on what's called ecological validity. Okay, so much ABA research is focused on issues of internal validity. So this is demonstrations of cause and effect. So namely that an independent variable, a treatment variable, can reliably cause uh, changes in a dependent variable, so the thing that is being um, measured in experimental situations, so with highly trained researchers in highly controlled uh, environments. This approach, though, is highly inconsistent with the PBS emphasis on normalisation and inclusion in natural community <coughs> contexts. So PBS instead really focuses on conducting all elements of um, treatment and research with only those individuals who would typically be working with a child, whether this be teachers, uh, parents, and so on. And in natural um, environment contexts where strict experimental control uh, would be limited. So one question um, to ask ourselves is whether this reduced emphasis on uh, experimental control in PBS can somehow undermine um, uh, the practice that we're, that we're using. Now the fourth point on this slide is concerned with who exactly is responsible for deciding the models of um, assessment and uh, intervention that we use. So in um, PBS, uh, these models rely really on a high level of um, active collaboration, so the wraparound services that I was talking about, from all of the key people uh, in an individual's uh, life. So again, you know, this could be parents, it could be siblings. With one of the young people that we uh, support, um, his taxi driver has a huge amount of input into uh, the interventions that we put in place. So this uh, differs um, uh, from the more traditional um, ABA approaches where models of assessment and intervention are much more expert driven. So behaviour analysts, BCBAs coming in and developing uh, treatment plans with very little input from other key people uh, who know the child uh, well. Yeah. One thing we have to ask ourselves is, is it possible that with more input from these people that don't necessarily have um, the uh, scientific training in applied behaviour an analysis, whether again this might possibly undermine uh, some of our practice. So I'm play, playing devil's advocate a bit here. Now the fifth uh, point that I wanted to make is with regards to how we go about deciding on which <laughs> treatments to implement with uh, the clients that we work with. So I mentioned earlier on about how person-centred values are a real crucial foundation in the development of uh, PBS. And there's a real emphasis on humanistic uh, values, which are often said to override the importance of scientific um, empirical data. 
So when deciding on uh, possible treatment options for an individual, in applied behaviour analysis, there's this real emphasis on what's called a technological criterion. So whether or not a treatment has been demonstrated to be effective in uh, the past, whether or not there are a number of uh, peer-reviewed uh, published studies on uh, a particular uh, treatment. But in PBS, there is an additional values criterion as well. So the capacity of techniques and strategies to be able to enhance the dignity of the person with disabilities that we're working with with, and also their opportunities for um, choice within their environment. So just to give you an example here, um, escape extinction might possibly meet the uh, technological criterion for selecting an intervention for a child with autism who has a, a feeding uh, disorder, in that it has been repeatedly demonstrated in the scientific uh, uh, literature to be a very uh, effective procedure. But if it doesn't meet the values criterion in uh, PBS, then it probably wouldn't be selected as a possible intervention. So again, we need to ask ourselves whether or not is PBS uh, good practice but bad science because this technological criterion for selecting uh, the interventions that we put in place uh, with the people that we work with, this technological criterion appears to be secondary to uh, the values criterion. One of um, the central uh, messages of PBS is also, and a few speakers have um, uh, mentioned this as well, is also that we should focus on uh, fixing problem contexts and not focus on uh, fixing problem behaviours. So to bring about uh, behaviour change as quickly as possible, multi-component interventions that change many different facets of an individual's environment at the same time are frequently implemented to try and pr bring about behaviour change as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, when multi-component uh, interventions are implemented, it's very difficult to see exactly which aspects of the intervention have ended up leading to uh, behaviour change. Now in ABA, there's a large amount of research demonstrating how the use of single treatments can produce uh, changes in behaviour. But these single treatments can often be uh, fairly ineffective in actual practice. So these demonstrations in ABA, they can make really great science, but poor practice, as multiple strategies implemented at the same time are often needed to try and bring about this really quick uh, behaviour change that we uh, want to see. Now the final point that I wanted uh, to make before I hand over uh, to Judy is that in uh, applied behaviour analysis, there's often more of an emphasis on consequence-based decelerative uh, techniques or a reactive uh, approach to problems in uh, times of crisis. Whereas in uh, PBS, there's much more of an emphasis on trying to come up with proactive or antecedent interventions um, to maintain the non-occurrence of a behaviour, to prevent the behaviour from occurring in uh, the first place. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is just hand you over to uh, Judy, who's going to um, describe our approach with um, a young boy that we work with. Hi, my name's Judy, and I'm going to talk about CP. He's a boy that I work with at Exeter House School, and this is his story. So CP has autism, he is high functioning, and in July 2013, he was eight years old and he had severe challenging behavior. He had just been excluded from an autism center, which was part of a mainstream school, and no other schools wanted to have him as a pupil. He was restrained on an almost daily basis because of severe self-injurious behavior and because of his aggression towards other children in the school and members of staff in the school. He swore frequently and he was kept inside the school at all times, even during break times. Um, and this was so that the other children couldn't hear his swearing and also the staff wanted to protect the other children from his aggressive acts. Academically, he hadn't made any progress in four years and as a result of this, he had very low self-esteem 
and he was a very unhappy boy. So the functional assessment revealed that his behaviours were maintained by attention, escape avoidance and access to tangibles. He found the academic work very difficult. His curriculum had been mismatched to his abilities and this was the main trigger for his challenging behaviour. So just to let you know, we've had permission to use this photo and also for the video which I'm going to be showing you later. So for most children, most of the children we work with, we draw up a summary sheet like this, which draws on Carr's key dimensions of PBS. I'll talk you through a couple of these to explain how we use them in CP's programme. So for comprehensive lifestyle change, in his previous school, the emphasis was very much on trying to change his behaviour without looking at wider systems change. But our focus was on changing his quality of life and by increasing his quality of life, we would then see a reduction in his challenging behaviour. We focused mainly on making school a fun place to be, and so we did lots of positive pairing with him, lots of fun activities, and CP got to interact more with his peers, and this was to increase his quality of life in school. And for emphasis on prevention, we did a functional assessment and we identified the functions of CP's behaviour. The focus of the programme was on carrying out antecedent strategies in order to reduce the motivation for challenging behaviour. We didn't really use reactive strategies um, or punishment such as timeout, um, and this, these had been commonly used in his old school. So the antecedent strategies that we used for behaviours maintained by escape. So we altered the demand and we did this by incorporating preferred materials into the task. So for example, when we were carrying out a maths lesson, we would count Lego bricks or toys that he had. Um, we would make the tasks more or less challenging. Um, we know that academic work was a trigger for his challenging behaviour. So. Um, we wouldn't make the task too challenging, but also if the task was less challenging, he would become bored, um, so it was important that we aimed it at the right level. We also offered him a choice of tasks and a choice in the order that he completed the task, and this meant that he was involved more in the decisions and he wasn't just being told what to do. We added predictability to the demand by preparing CP for what was coming up and telling him exactly how long we would be doing the task for. Um, so he knew exactly what was required, how long he would be doing the task for. And we also helped him to see where the demand fitted into his routine. So we had a visual schedule and he would know exactly what he'd, been, he'd have to do that day. So this graph shows um, our focus on improving CP's quality of life. and. Um, we wanted to know how he participated in activities at school and how much he enjoyed the activities. And this had implications for the data that we collected. We used a global method of data collection to reflect CP's enjoyment and participation in daily activities, rather than just focusing on micro levels of measurements such as the frequency of aggressive acts to peers. And this graph shows the activities that we would do in a typical week. Um, and you can see here, see here that there are greens, oranges, and reds. So green meant that he was engaged in the activity, that he was enjoying it, and that he was compliant. Orange means that he was um, semi-compliant um, and sort of partially engaged in the activity. Red means that there was some challenging behaviour. And as you can see in this week, there were many greens, so he was having lots of fun, he was enjoying the activities, and there were just two oranges, which meant that he was partially compliant for just two, two of the activities in this week. So, how is CP doing now? Ten months after we started the PBS programme, he's learning to read, write and do maths, and he's doing really well. He's learning at a really fast rate, um, and we can't see any evidence of a, a learning disability, so his lack of academic progress in the past was mainly due to his challenging behaviour. 
He's really enjoying learning and his self-esteem has really increased. He's a really happy boy and he doesn't stop smiling. He has friends now that he can hang around with and he really enjoys interacting with the children in the school. And I'm going to end now with a video of CP doing a Head Sprout episode. And Head Sprout is a, an online reading resource that we've been using to teach him how to read. And this video will also show you how much he enjoys doing it and or show you a little bit of his personality as well. Sing right. Oh, nice. Eat that. You learn and corny sounds. And you that's how turtles sing. That's how turtles sing. You finished that. that. That's just so Charlie. People, that's how turtles sing. Nice and look. Hey, people, that's how turtles sing. Ah, peace, my brother. Yeah, I should have seen dinosaurs. Pass you over to Sammy. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking to you about um, supporting ASL children um, at St Nicholas School using um, PBS. So um, I started with this quote to, as I be, uh, feel it um, concisely sums up the challenges faced when it comes to implementing the PBS model. The attempt to work scientifically with human behaviours is often demanding, as the very nature of um, behaviour is so complicated and complex. So as Karina's already mentioned, how we work, um, when adopting the PBS model, um, we incorporate many theories, applications um, of behaviour analysis. And to bring about behaviour change as quickly as possible, we adopt a multi-component um, intervention model. Um, so as again, she's already um, spoken about, with so many independent variables be being manipulated at any one time, it's very difficult to know um, which intervention has led to a specific behaviour change. Um, so going back to the initial premise of um, our presentation, does that mean that positive behaviour support, support is evidenced by good practice but bad science? So um, we were commissioned by Wiltshire Council to undertake, uh, undertake a PBS programme at St Nicholas School in Chippenham, um, from 2009 to 2012. The initial purpose was to support a child whose behaviour was very challenging and who's posed um, a high risk of school and family breakdown. Um, unfortunately, it transpired by, by, both by our organisation and the school um, that he would not be able to be properly supported um, at the school, either academically um, or behaviourally. Um, Subsequently, though, um, our company was um, funded for a further three more years, from 2012 to 2015, to enable the approach to be better integrated within the school and to benefit more pupils, um, especially the under eights. Um, the programme was also to be implemented not just at the school, but also at Cannons House Respite Home, the idea being to achieve a generalisation across settings. Support and advice would also be available to parents as well to help them inter in implement the interventions in the home. So in this instance, the PBS model would be implemented not just on a case-by-case -case basis, but it would also encompass a service-wide approach whereby the PBS framework work would be implemented at varying levels of intensity via a tiered model of prevention. So the objectives um, of the programme would, were to increase the level of participation in the learning activities of the pupils 
promoting progress in key and functional skills. To increase the consistency between settings, to enable all people working with pupils to acquire new intervention skills and develop working practices that better enable the consistency between the settings. There would be a team around the child approach, allowing families, carers, staff and other professionals to develop a holistic approach to open communication and involvement when devising programmes for children. It would hope that um, in turn this would raise the level of competency um, among the staff team in being able to deal with the needs of the children. And finally, the hope was to be able to decrease challenging behaviour so that the pupils um, would be able to live and be educated in Wiltshire wherever possible and be able to preserve the family bonds and enable the services to deliver their, um, their needs in a cost-effective way. So the challenge, how to deliver all these outcomes by um, implementing a scientifically robust systematic model while at the same time delivering a person-centred approach. So since I've been working at the school in, um, since October 2013, I've been working with 15 children um, aged between 55 and 17 years old um, and they've been comprised of three structured classes, um, structured in that they benefit from highly structured routines and regulations as well as, as well as a consistent approach from staff. And here's a breakdown of all their different needs and requirements. So um, initially I've been doing assessments both in skills areas and behavioural assessments. Um, obviously working in a school I need to be working as part of a national curriculum syllabus um, and I'm using the B squared which is part of the school syllabus. Um, ASD pupils tend to have a spiky profiles. They don't learn in a linear fashion um, and some of the skills are easier for them to, to accomplish and others are, are more difficult. Um, this assessment is great in that it's able to document areas where the pupils need more progress. So the assessment of basic language and learning skills um, is a device for assessing skills in children with language and learning difficulties commonly used with ASD children. It is guided by a behavioural analytic perspective on all aspects of human behaviour, principally language, and provides parents and professionals with a curriculum that can serve as a basis of a selection of educational objectives. Sorry. The Essential for Living assessment was designed for individuals with moderate to severe, to severe learning disabilities with limited, limited skills repertoires like those of ASD children. Part of the assessment includes an essential eight, um, which, which are eight essential skills necessary for a happy, fulfilling and productive life. Without these skills, um, individuals will almost certainly exhibit problem behaviour, have limited access to preferred items, activities, places and people, as well as limited contact and interaction with the community. The assessment of functional living skills looks to assess and subsequently teach the necessarily skills of independence in home, school and community settings. Part of the assessment is the basic le um, living skills module, which looks, which, look, which looks at skills in basic self-help, self-care, self-management, hygiene, routines and core communication skills. These skills, if not mastered, will have a profound impact on a learner's ability to live independently. The Behaviour of Concern Assessment is an informant-based questionnaire which looks at gaining a functional view of behaviours, understanding what motivates and maintains them, as well as attempting to hypothesise when they are most, most likely to occur. Um, in addition to these measures, I've been also been conducting direct observations on specific target behaviours and using information provided by staff um, in the form of scatter plots and ABC charts. So, so far, I've completed um, the following assessments, um, as you can see. Um, and since I've finished the assessments, um, as part of the PBS model, um, we've been focusing on um, um, multi-component interventions, which um, focus on improving the following skills areas. Um, and a reduction of interfering and inappropriate behaviours um, is a consequence of the above skills being in increased. So within the, th the three classes that I've been working with, um, I've been recommending um, whole class interventions, which look at um, implementing personalised visual schedules, increasing choice and an emotional intelligence, strategies to functionally ask for help, a break, or how to wait for a delay, um, and then also working alongside the staff team to, um, to educate them that skills teaching occurs at all times in all settings 
and in ensuring that they have a consistent approach. So now I'm going to be talking about three particular children um, that I've been working with um, quite, quite a lot recently. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, um, these are the skill domains that we've been working, um, working on targets for. Um, so as you can see from the table, um, we've managed to master. Um, he can now sit at a table um, for up to 10 minutes, um, which is quite an achievement since we've only been doing this since the beginning of May. Um, the initial target was um, just to be sitting at a table for 20 seconds. Um, and he's also now mastered being able to participate in 30% of the lessons daily. Um, we're now working towards the next target of 40%. Um, and the final one is he's um, now able to match um, te approximately 10 pictures, where the initial target behaviour for that was to independently match um, three pictures. So the second child that we've been working with quite a lot recently, um, he's now uh, being um, successfully able to indicate, um, sorry, independently request five preferred items by using PECs. Um, he's now managed to achieve this not just in the school setting, but also in Canon's house. And as I mentioned before, that was a big part of the objectives of the programme. Um, and he's now able to master accepting delays, being able to wait calmly for a 10 seconds for a preferred item. Um, and as you can see, the rest are ongoing, um, but he's quite near to, to, to getting there with, with, I think, at least a couple more of them. And then the final case study um, boy that we've been working with. Um, as yet, nothing has been mastered, but I've been doing quite a lot of work with him in the last couple of weeks alongside the staff team. Um, and he's nearly at the stage where he can now independently ask for help um, with a help card. Um, this had a two-pronged effect. He was doing a lot of SIB behaviours because of an es escape maintained um, function. Um, but now, through, 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 through teaching him how to use his system, um, there's definitely been a reduction in the SIB. Um, and the other one that we're nearly close to mastering is the writing. He's now able to independently trace two letters of his name. Uh, he's just got two more to go. So going back to um, the initial premise of PBS model, it's values-led but data-driven. So here's a piece of data. <laughs> um, uh, this is going back to MV, the first case study I was um, talking about. Um, the initial target was to get him to sit at a table for 20 seconds. Um, as you can see in the baseline measures, um, he was only able to sit at a table for approximately two or three seconds at a time before either displaying challenging behaviour or just getting up off the table, um, getting away from the table. So um, <clears throat> the attending programme was introduced on the 7th of May. And the, um, the intervention strategy for that was to um, encourage him to sit at a table, um, giving him initially three highly preferred tasks to do, and then giving him a break um, after he'd completed those three tasks. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, it, it worked incredibly well, and we were giving him access to regular um, breaks, c contingent or non-contingent on behavior. Um, and then within a short space of time, he's now um, on two occasions um, it's been recorded that he's able to sit at a table for 10 minutes, which is quite an achievement. So along the way, there have been barriers to my progress and the progress of the interventions. Um, there's been a lot of resistance, well, not a lot, but a little bit of resistance and reluctant, reluctance from the staff team to implement the recommendations that I've been suggesting. Um, also, um, interventions, when I have been recommending them, they haven't been rec um, implemented um, necessarily as I would be recommending. Um, examples of this are schedules of reinforcement. Um, and then finally, um, the data sheets to monitor progress for the interventions, which is so important to be able to understand if an intervention is working um, as it should be, um, there's, have either been inconsistently filled in or not filled in at all. So solutions to these barriers, um, I've been trying to work a lot with the staff team to um, have a, an open dialogue with them and to speak to them as much about what I'm trying to get them to do and understanding the, the relevance of and, the, and the significance of what I'm trying to do. Um, and that as well, I've been doing a lot of education by sitting in with them on team meetings, which I try and do weekly. Um, I'm trying to get them actively participating and involved in these interventions as much as possible. Um, one of the other ob objectives of this program is that eventually the ownership of this um, that this way of working will become an in-house school 
um, I don't know what's just happened there. Um, an in-house um, school um, thing. So, so, so over time, my my input will kind of fade out. Um, alongside um, helping the, the, the staff team be able to implement the interventions, I'm there to support them and facilitate them as much as I possibly can. So I'm always there to sort of listen to any questions they have um, and and support them with you know any any barriers they might have themselves. And finally. There's a lot of negotiation and, and um, flexibility that needs to occur. Um, so I have to work very much around their schedules and their routines to fit around you know, th their working practices. Um, because obviously, when we're implementing these interventions, these children are part of a bigger you know, class with other pupils. So it has to be practical for them. So going back to the original um, question, PBS model, is it good practice but bad science? Um, you know, as it's already been spoken about um, a lot, it's a values-led but data-driven model. Um, you know, each stage of the assessment is driven by, um, you know, research, literature, and data gathered from a focal person's environment. Um, the use of behavioral technologies and evidence-based practice practices are not about producing one-off outcomes or short-term demonstrations um, in controlled environments. Um, what PBS is um, concerned about is enhancing quality of life um, and making um, long-term lifestyle changes to the individual. Um, these are outcomes which not, are not only you know, week-long or month-long, but these are lifestyle changes that will be sustained for years. So finally, I just want to say many thanks to all the staff team at St Nicholas School in Cannons House. Without all their hard work, I wouldn't be able to stand up here and presenting the work that I'm doing today. So now I'm going to pass you over to Freddie Jackson Brown to sum up. Hello, everybody. Um, so at the end here, I'm going to try and bring together what's been said and see if um, I can answer a little bit that provocative question that we had in the title about whether PBS is good practice but bad science. Um, it's going to be a bit of a theoretical outline, which I think is always a little bit difficult after you have all that kind of rich clinical stuff, the videos and the stuff that, that Judy and Sally have been showing. So um, I hope that's not going to put you to sleep too much at the end of the day. But I remember hearing once that there's nothing as practical as a good theory. So hopefully by going into some of the, practical, the, the theoretical stuff, it will be practically useful at some point. Um, so the title for this um, presentation was actually given to us by Sandy Toogood when he came down to provide some external supervision for us. Uh, he, we were showing him some of the work that we were doing that we were quite pleased with, and he was reflecting on it. He said, yeah, it's great PBS, but is it bad science? Now, um, I like to pride myself as being a scientist practitioner, so there's a bit of a jar to me. Think, is it bad science? What do you mean? Um, and he, he asked this sort of question, which I think the guys had touched on a little bit before, uh, about whether um, actual PBS, the multi-component element of PBS, is, is really compatible with the scientific process. PBS is often tries to pull lots of levers all at once to try and get quick solutions. If we can get quick solutions, why would we go for slow solutions? Uh, we often pull all these levers, and we're never quite sure then what, which of those levers has led to which part of the outcome, whereas science tends to want to have a much tighter relationship between the independent and dependent variable. Um, so that was the kind of question that Sandy was, was um, posing to us, and what we've been trying to kind of have a think about, really, with some of the examples of our practice. So I'll, if you don't mind, I'll go into a little bit of kind of theoretical stuff about, a little bit about what science is, a little bit about what practice is, and see about how PBS maybe meshes those two together. So science is everywhere. It's, you know, a core part of our society, and it's about, you know, it's a nice um, a definition that I got from Wikipedia, I think it was. Um, but the, the bottom bullet point really describes what it is. It's really about trying to describe functional relationships between different variables. That's what it's trying to do. And the variables which you uh, focus on, they become your phenomena of interest, and they set the, the science, if you like. They determine what science you're going to be, uh, what your science is going to be called. So if it happens to be subatomic particles, it may be called physics. If it's molecules and how they interact, it may be called chemistry. And of course, if it's human behavior, then we call it psychology or behavior analysis or lots of different terms that kind of mean the same thing. We're trying to understand what it is about the human condition. Now, one of the 
tricky things about going last at the end of lots of great presentations is you end up repeating things that people have said previously. So <laughs> apologies for that. But this kind of goes back a little bit to one of the things that Carl was saying, that in psychology, behavior analysis, whatever we want to call it, our subject matter is everything that the individual does. And what we're going to try and do is describe the functional relationship between what we do and our environmental context. One thing which is important to, to emphasize, this thing, again, that Carl touched on, is that the environmental context is both out there, but we've all got an environment inside our bodies as well, which, which we behave towards. So there are things that take place inside my body, thoughts, feelings, which I respond to. And those also need to be included in the analysis. So we're not just talking about the relationship with our behavior, uh, our behavior to the external world, but also to that small part of the world which happens to be inside our skin. It's a very important part of a behavior analytic analysis that we include our relationship with what's going on inside us. Hence, thoughts and feelings are at the core of a psychological stroke behavior analytic science. Um, I just want to go back a little bit and say, well, you know, why, we, why do we study behavior in relation to the environment? What's the big deal? Well, psychology and particularly behavior analysis see behavior within an evolutionary framework. So behavior is how an organism relates to the world around it. Um, and uh, if that organism is going to survive, that relationship has to be functional in some way. It has to work for the individual. If that behavior is just random, then the organism isn't going to survive too long. So within an evolutionary model, we understand behavior to have a functional benefit for the individual, which supports its survival. And survival means access to things that you need to get through the day, food, sustenance, um, temperature control, and ultimately, social and sexual contact. So we look to, uh, under well, we understand behavior as being functional because it comes from that evolutionary context. Um, and we see the learning process as the, uh, an evolved ability for the organism to adapt to the environment within its own individual lifetime. So we understand evolution, typically to, to, to talk about biological evolution, and that's how species evolve across individual lifetimes. So individual species will evolve and change as individual uh, organisms live and die. Whereas within behavior analysis, we understand learning as a process by which the individual organism adapts to the environment within their lifetime. So there's an evolutionary process of adaptation across lifetimes, but also within lifetimes. And learning is the process by which we do that. And that's why, for a psychology behavior analysis, we're trying to understand that relationship between the organism and the environment. So um, what we try and do is chart that relationship. If we do this over here, what happens over there? If we pull this lever in the environment, how does that affect the organism? If the organism does this, how does that affect the environment? And that's the functional relationship that we're trying to chart within science, within psychological science. Um, it usually works by pulling one lever at a time. If you move lots of levers at the same time, it's kind of difficult to know what effect you're having. And the, the example that I might have is a controlled diet. You know, if you're trying to work out what part of your diet is having an effect on you, if you stop having caffeine, sugar, and maybe wheat at the same time, and you start feeling better, you're not quite sure which one of those it is. So typically within a controlled diet, what we would do was just change one variable at a time, see what effect that has. And then we would change another variable at a time, see what effect that has. And then another one, you might combine them. You might combine wheat and sugar, potentially, as you get more sophisticated. But we do it through tightly controlled processes, whereby we just change one variable and see what happens to another variable. So that's broadly my somewhat crude understanding of science and of psychological science. So what about therapy or, or, or clinical practice or intervention, depending on what you want to call it? Uh, I, I, simply, I simply think of it as change. I mean, people want intervention or they want therapy because they want to have some kind of change taking place. You don't go along for intervention or for therapy because you want things to stay the same. You want things to change. Um, so. Uh, PBS is a, is a, a, a back to the, the kind of the question here then, is that PBS is a type of intervention which looks to uh, bring about positive changes in people's lives. It wants to bring about positive therapeutic change and quickly. And if you go along, if you want to have some change, if you want to have a therapy, even if it's like you've got a, a headache or something, when you take that pill, you want it to have a quick effect. In fact, I was, I was, when I was up in London recently, I saw some adverts for I think it was for Nurofen. It was trying to show, actually, if you take this new, this new particular drug, it has a very, very quick effect. We want change to be quick. 
And that's the case for our clients too. If, if they're having a difficult time, if they're in difficult circumstances, we want change to be quick for them. Why would we want it to be slow? So what we would then do potentially is change a whole load of variables all at once. And, and Sally and Judy gave some good examples of that. We change a whole load of things at once to try and bring about change. Now, those things aren't completely random. Those things that we're choosing to change are based on what the scientific background knowledge has told us that might be useful to change and what research papers or clinical experience has told us would be useful to change. But we, pull the, we, we try and change them all at once to try and bring about as quick change as possible. So that may well be good practice, but is it bad science? Because what we're then not sure is which bit of what we were doing really made the difference. That charting a tight functional relationship between your independent variable and your dependent variable isn't there within PBS. And we couldn't tell you how much of a percentage, we couldn't do some kind of analysis of how much of a percentage of the change that we saw was due to this part or due to that part. We just learned that when we pulled all these levers, things got better. Now, we're quite happy with that within PBS, but is it good science? Uh, so I was going to have a look at a little bit of a, a kind of a, uh, an analogy here, really, and, and point out that, that PBS, I guess, is a technology, and it's a, it's a psychological technology or an applied behavior analytic technology, and this is maybe for another day, but we often use ABA as if it were the technology. It's not. It's the overarching science, and within that overarching science, you've got a whole load of different technologies. PBS is one of them. Acceptance of commitment therapy is another. Active support, PECs, they're all... ABA technologies, all within that. Anyway, it's a different, longer conversation, maybe. So PBS is a, is a, a technology which uses the knowledge and the methods of science uh, without necessarily feeding back into that science. And, um, you know, maybe a good example of this is a functional analysis. We use a, 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 that's a very tightly controlled method for us to understand maybe the functions, the meaning of a function, just being the meaning, the meaning of that behaviour for the individual, and then we use that meaning to pull a whole load of levers all at, all at once, because <coughs> we want to have quick change, because we want quality of life to happen quickly. Um, so we are using what we know about the science, what works, and the methods to uh, produce a technology which can produce quick change. And I've got at the bottom there a sort of an analogy, really, which is if you worked in a chocolate factory, they use the scientific process to, to, to make their chocolate processes and uh, chocolate process to make their chocolate. Uh, they would, um, you know, some very clever people would design the machines to, to, uh, to make sure that they work efficiently. They understand what the chocolate's made of and what ingredients they've got to put together. And they make great chocolate, which we all eat. Or it could be watches or cutlery or tar, car tires, whatever it is. But that information then doesn't feed back into the basic science which then led to that technology. We just say this is a technology which we're using the, the core sciences. We're not feeding it back in. And that's okay with technology. So um, where's the science in PBS? I would argue that, that our practice is underpinned by science uh, but not necessarily contributing back into the core science. Now, that's not completely true. And I went to a great presentation earlier which Sarah Wakeling did, and she had some lovely PBS data, but really tightly controlled, showing some really interesting uh, uh, relationships between the environment and a person's rum rumination behavior. You've got me saying that word wrong now, Sarah. Um, and, uh, and that, I think, probably could go back and contribute to the scientific knowledge. But actually, by and large, that's not what we're trying to do within PBS. We're just trying to bring about positive change and quickly. I think you could argue, though, that if you use the scientific principles and they give you good outcomes, you could argue that you're corroborating the scientific knowledge and the scientific basis of what you're doing. So you could say that there's a kind of independent corroboration of the basis of what you're doing. Um, so I've talked about the fact that we also tend to see ourselves as scientists, practitioners, which I think is an important element. Uh, and I think also the last point yeah, is that I think we do need to have a close relationship between the practitioners, us people who are doing the work, and, the, and those clever people who are doing the kind of the lab work, really, because uh, they don't know what the important things are that we want them to be researching. We, they don't know what the important functional relationships that we need to know about in order to be able to bring about change with our clients and for our clients. So we need to be telling them and helping them, having dialogue with them about what it is we need to know more about um, so that we can be better at our practice. We do need a close relationship with the core science without necessarily contributing it to it directly. So, oh, there is one more slide. 
No, there isn't. Okay, well, there was one more slide, I thought. Um, and it was meant to be my answer to this somewhat provocative question <laughs> that, that uh, Sandy gave us. And Sandy, of course, is being provocative. He just wanted to see how we'd respond to it. And uh, the answer I came up with is I think, I think PBS is good practice based on good science. And it's not a scientific process directly, but it uses good science. So it's good practice based on good science is how I would see PBS. So uh, that brings together our presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Freddie, Karina, Sally, and Judy for uh, that great presentation and very thought-provoking. Um, can I just ask everyone to please complete your evaluation forms before you leave? Um, and I just want to invite up onto the stage um, Mahan Mohammed, uh, Mohammed, who's been very central in making this event happen. Um, he's put in a, a, a lot of effort to, to make it all happen today and for it all to run as smoothly as he has. So, so yeah, he, he was just to say a couple of final words. Um, it's late in the day, and trust me, I am very relieved we've got to this time of the day. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I apologize. The workshop for Kirsty Bishop didn't happen, um, 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 and there was a good turnout, but fortunately, Kirsty is here, you know, safe and sound, and I did tell her there were about 60 people, a very good turnout for her workshop. She said to me it's because the word sex was included in the title. <laughs> Okay, um, I hope today's menu or agenda that Jonathan and I put together has significantly, if you like, clarify or enhance our understanding of PBS. And for that, I would like to thank all the presenters who have done a marvelous job for presenting their work. A round of applause. <laughs> <clears throat> there was a high demand for places and we've had to turn many people down and unfortunately I learned today that about some people didn't turn up at all so I could have offered the free places to others although I did sneak a few in <laughs> um, yeah but for those who couldn't be here um, we've, we've got a video for this for, for, for all the sessions which I will upload on the university website and Jonathan will put on his chat Facebook site, yeah. and we can. Yeah. I could we thank the um, IT guys yeah, that are here as well because yeah. I think they've, they've done an excellent job today. Oh, hoping it will happen. And also Chris Hardy, who's brought over um, the videos um, as well, and he's helped us yeah. to get some of the videos too. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to, to, to thank the technician because their slide didn't go down very well, did they? Some of them were missing. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank the sponsors, uh, Thames Valley and Wessex Higher Education, in, uh, in particular Elaine Bowden, who, who fund this event. I would also like to thank University of Hertfordshire, my head of department, Jackie Kelly, my uh, academic uh, lead, Paul Mallory, who couldn't be here today. Uh, he was very supportive, and he gave me the support in the name of a lady called Carol Tolley. Is Carol here? Yeah, at the back, without her, whom many of you have dealt with, without her, I don't think I would have been able to put this together because there was so much administration behind the scene. I would also like to thank the four students who've been around helping you guys, Nicola, Maria, Shepherd, Claire. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Jonathan for wearing his suit and a tie today. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, it's been a great day. It's been a great day, and I hope you'll be able to take away the knowledge, the experience that various presenters have shared with you and start your own journey of positive behavior support, whether it's a good science or a bad science, but turn it into good practice. Uh, and while you do that, do take on board some of the comments that were said this morning, in particular uh, the parents' representation. Do involve parents in, in, in our thinking. They have a major contribution to make. Also, think strategically about how do we 
uh, educate and train practitioners. That was mentioned this morning by Louise and later on taken up by Linda and Hazel Powell. Also, I'd like to make a point, which is a personal thing I have about when we do PBS, there is a tendency for a micro implementation of it. I would, I would say to you that if you want to succeed, think of a service-wide approach. And remember the talk of Jonathan Shaw, John Griffith, and Branwen Davis. When you do a, a service-wide approach, you involve everybody, and there are more room for success. The technology is bigger. <laughs> uh, last but not least, it's late in the day. Take the good work forward into, into, in, into your workplace. And while you're on that journey, I wish you a safe trip home. Thank you, and best wishes. Well done. Well done.